Good morning. Welcome back to the Broadcast Retirement Network. I'm Jeff Snyder. This is BRN Weekly for Saturday, February 10th, 2024. And our top story today, will there be a recession in 2024? Joining me now to discuss this and a lot more, Jane King is a financial journalist joining us from the NASDAQ and Christina Hooper is the chief global market strategist for Invesco. Jane, always great to see you. Thanks so much for joining us. And Christina, welcome back to the program this morning. Yeah, great to be here, Jeffrey, and great to meet you. Yes, absolutely. Great to be on. Great to be with you, Jane. Yeah, uh, well, Christine, I want you're, you're the uh, you're you're returning as a guest, so I want to start with you, and then we'll we'll go to Jane. Let's talk about 2024 because uh, you know we've had this inverted yield curve, or or we've been told this recession indicator uh, that's an inverted yield curve, and I think like we've been talking about recession over the years for so many times, yet the economy is still plugging along, um, you know, a good S&P 500 at record highs. I want to get your perspective. I mean, you're in the weeds, no pun intended, every day talking about this stuff. How do you see the market in 2024? And are we in danger of a recession? So first, Jeff, I think it's interesting that you bring up the inverted yield curve. It's something that has vexed clients and investors for a long time now, um, because at first they really were anticipating an imminent recession. And it's hard to kind of, I don't know how to say this, but it's it's hard to dismiss it, right? Because historically it's been quite accurate. But I do believe, you know, I think about quantitative tightening, sort of this very high level of debt issuance. I think there are, and other factors that are out there that kind of skew the yield curve um, and and may have, have created the kind of significant inversion. That's not to say that we, won't see a recession, uh, but I don't think we're going to see a recession in 2024. And really, there, there are two key reasons for that in my estimation. Number one, just how strong the labor market is. It is very hard, in my opinion, to go into recession when you have an unemployment rate at 3.7%. And let's just assume that because of the aggressive monetary tightening, um, we see more job losses this year. I don't think that would be surprising. But let's say we even get up to 4.7, 5% unemployment. I'm still very skeptical that that would trigger a recession in 2024. It might in 2025, um, but, but not in 24. The other kind of key reason that I focus on for why the economy is doing so well and why we haven't gone into recession and won't go into recession this year is the fact that Americans enjoy um, the privilege of long-term fixed rate mortgages, something that many of our, our counterparts, European consumers, Canadian consumers can't avail themselves of. Um, there, if we look at the statistics, and this hasn't always been the case, going into the global financial crisis, we know the epicenter of it was housing, and it was caused by all these variable rate mortgages that were resetting. But Americans learned their lesson, and so about 92% of outstanding mortgages today are fixed rate with an average rate of a little over 3.6%. So, uh, Often for most uh, households, your housing expense is your biggest or one of your biggest expenses, if not the biggest. And so to have that be fixed um, is huge. It means that the lagged effects of monetary policy aren't impacting you as much as your European counterparts, your Canadian counterparts who don't have that luxury of long-term fixed rate mortgages. So that is a long-winded way, Jeff, and I apologize, Jeff and Jane, for taking so long to explain this, but, but in my opinion, those are two really critical reasons why we're not going to go into recession in 2024. Yeah. And, and you don't have to apologize to me, Christina. Uh, Jane, I want to come to you. I mean, you you are at the NASDAQ. You're at the NASDAQ every day early and you're watching this. Uh, you have a, maybe a little bit different perspective. S&P 500 at all-time record highs, the Magnificent Seven. How, how are you seeing the economy? Are you hearing the R word from people that you interview and talk to, because you're talking to you know, industry leaders as well. Well, less and less than a year ago, we were hearing recession talk more. I feel like that's kind of faded away. Um, just a couple of statistics uh, in the most recent quarter, CEO confidence was up. So that tells me no recession imminent. Um, and in fact, in a presidential election year, the way that January goes is how the whole year goes, 
11 out of 11 times. So, um, you know, there are some kind of macro things that are telling us. Now, there's a lot of underlying problems with the economy. Auto delinquencies are up. Credit card debt is up. Delinquencies are up. New York manufacturing was a disappointment. So there's definitely some problems out there. It's not perfect. And there's been a lot of tech layoffs this year as well. But it does look like, barring anything unforeseen and like a pandemic or a war or something like that, we may be able to skirt and not uh, have a recession this year. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that, Jane. And, and Christina, I want to come back to you because we started off, I started off by asking about the inverted yield curve. Is that still the measure of a recession? Because a lot of Americans, myself included, um, even though I've been in the business for a while, you know, that's the thing that we always look at. I mean, it, do we have to look at other, as you're pointing out, other items um, to de determine? And is it more of a three-dimensional thinking rather than, okay, we have an inverted yield curve, we've had it for X, we're, we're due for a recession? I do think we're going to have to look at other factors. I think of um, the economy and, and really indicators of where we're headed as part of a mosaic. And we just have to look at that complete picture because Jane's right. I mean, we're certainly seeing an increase in delinquencies. All is not well. Cracks are appearing, uh, but those are cracks that can appear um, in a slowdown. We don't necessarily have to go into recession. So we think it is um, very one dimensional, as you point out, Jeff, to just look at uh, the yield curve, especially since there are, um, I would argue, some extenuating circumstances that there are other factors at play that may have altered the yield curve at least somewhat. Um, now, that's not to say we won't go into a recession in 2025. I'm watching that carefully um, because I think what we're going to see is a slowdown in the first half of this year and then a mid-cycle reacceleration in the back half of this year. Um, but 2025 is still very much a question mark, again, because of the lagged effects of monetary policy. It can take time um, for, for them to, to for, for those aggressive rate hikes to show up in the economy. Yeah. And, and uh, Jane, come, pivoting back to you and apologize, ladies, because I do have we do have to run in a, in a few minutes. But Jane, I want to come to you and talk a little bit about the rate hike. And, and uh, last week, you and I talked about the odds of uh, a rate rate cut, I guess it was in in March and May. How much, how pivotal is that um, for for the market? Are you what are you hearing? What are you seeing in terms of uh, how the the market is now pricing in what Jerome Powell and his uh, Fed friends are saying about uh, interest yeah. rates? Well, I think we can write March off, you know, completely. I mean, the Fed chair mentioned this uh, during the press conference and then was on 60 Minutes reiterating it for people who aren't in the business press and who, you know, were just interested in the mainstream press. So um, I think that's off the table. And I imagine given current conditions, unless anything major changes, May will be off the table as well. Then you start to get close to the election. It gets a little political. And so I, I don't know. They're probably just, you know, holding on to some fire, seeing what the economic data is between now and, and May. Yeah. And, and Christina, well, I'm with you and, and appreciate, Jane, your your insight. Uh, let's talk about those rate cuts for a second. Your perspective and what are what are uh, what are you thinking about? You mentioned 2025. We could have the a slowdown or the R word appear. Um, but uh, in terms of those rate hikes, how 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 important is that to the market and, and to fund managers and, and others? Well, I think it's really important that rate hikes have ended. Um, that tends to be historically the start of a good period of performance for the stock market. But of course, we know that there's typically on average a eight and a half month lag between the last rate hike and the first rate cut. So markets are looking to and anticipating a rate cut in the first half of this year. I actually think we'll get it. Uh, I think Chair Powell doth protest too much. He's trying to tamp down uh, an easing of financial conditions that he has a vested interest in doing that. And that can include um, miscommunicating, or should I say, um, sounding hawkish um, to markets until they're actually ready to cut. So uh, I wouldn't write off March. I do think it's a very, very low probability, but I wouldn't write it off. But I'm pretty confident that we're going to see a cut uh, by May 1st. Well, I... Look, you, you guys are uh, people that follow the market on a day-to-day -day basis, and you understand Fed jargon, and you speak the language. So I have great confidence in your analysis. 
Christina, Jane, always great to see you both. Thanks so much for joining us. And we look forward to having you back on the program again very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jane and Christina. Appreciate all your perspectives and your insight. We come back, we'll take a look at some of our best segments for the week. You're going to want to stay tuned right here on BRN Weekly. Imagine a new television network that will make you richer, healthier, and in control of your financial future. This network is for the policewoman in Nashville, Tennessee, the baker in Dubuque, Iowa, the teacher in Lexington, Kentucky. We want to make the idea of savings and retirement culturally relevant. But what do you see as a defining issue of the midterms? Especially for the smaller businesses, I mean, they are the lifeblood of the American economy. Featuring exclusive interviews, current affairs, and docu-series. 33 yeah. years old, you retired early. The philosophy is money only matters if it helps you live a life that you love. But you gotta start thinking about retirement as soon as you get in. The Broadcast Retirement Network will drive very high engagement with premium partnerships. So this isn't retirement and savings for your parents or grandparents. This is for all Americans. And we're gonna change the way you think about money. Welcome to the next frontier of retirement and savings. This is BRN, the Broadcast Retirement Network. Welcome back. It was a great week of shows, great topics, of course, great guests. We kicked off the week with a look at helping veterans that are struggling. Let's take a look. Well, I'm, I'm very proud to say I'm, I was invited to be a member of the board of directors of Kevin Sog. It's a 501c3 that was established by Gail and John Urso, a couple from Gross Point, Michigan. They lost their son, Justin, 10 years ago and had significant difficulty finding resources and support for those that are, are newly bereaved by suicide. And they took it upon themselves to establish Kevin's song. Uh, their, their son, Kevin, was a a musician and an artist, and, and they picked a, it's a lovely song, by the way, and uh, created the 501c3. So for the last 10 years, they've been growing support here in, in uh, Southeast Michigan for suicide prevention and also for support of those who are bereaved by suicide loss. We call it survivor of suicide loss. The, the number of Veteran suicides increased dramatically over the past 10 years. Uh, the statistics that we have, Jeff, lag over a year because the information has to go from the city to the county to the state to the feds. Uh, but nonetheless, in 1922, there, there was a slight decrease in the number of, of suicide by veterans. However, we're, we're still at, at 20 veterans per day taking their own life. There is no common acceptance of, of a root cause, Jeff. That's, that's an excellent question. I, I can share some thoughts and opinions from my own perspective, perhaps. Uh, the resources available to veterans vary dramatically across the country. So that, that would be issue number one. Issue number two, the means for suicide are very readily available. And my firearms account for more than half of the uh, Michigan suicides. And in men, it's 91% of the suicides are by firearm. So there's a, a gun issue that is um, not being addressed. The reluctance of veterans to seek out the service services available to them is, is also an issue. There's there's an inertia. And 
for members of your audience who are, are familiar with, with depression or, or mental illness, I mean, some days it's a challenge to get out of bed and brush your teeth, let alone go down to the VA and, and go through the, the process of, of going through a support system. So uh, inertia, I guess, is is one of the items. And the other is is the, if I can use the phrase, machismo, that I'm a rough, tough military veteran and I, I can, well, the, the SEALs say embrace the suck. So yeah. I can deal with this. Well, the reality is, Unfortunately, most can't, and we we just need to create a a better culture uh, of acceptance for mental health and depression support, and we need to we need to stop the stigma. The yeah. last, if I may, I know I'm carrying yeah. on, but I have no, one other item. I, Again, my personal opinion that the that the emotional uh, support services offered within the military, uh, there there is a suspicion by by the the members that any use of of mental health services is going to limit their career progression. So they would rather suffer in silence than risk future promotion. The, the there is a huge impact on society as a whole. The, the statistics tell us 37 people are impacted by each suicide. In our audience here today, uh, it, it, one in 20 are thinking of suicide. One in 10 of your audience have within the, you know, the old phrase, six degrees of separation, one in 10 have a direct connection to a family member or a close friend or colleague who has suicided. However, most people don't speak up and take advantage of, of the support networks. There are a large number of not-for-profits uh, that have been formed across the country. And there's the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention that has a website which has listings of local resources uh, here at Kevin's Song, I, I mentioned we're in Southeast Michigan, but we have uh, a video session once a week for survivors of, of suicide support. And, sorry, survivors of suicide loss. And we also have an in-person session, but the Zoom session, uh, the first Wednesday of every month, uh, we have people from all over the country that have participated in the group. So if, if you would Anyone who has had a suicide loss, we encourage them to contact us. We, we will help you get a direction or go to the American Foundation or your local mental health association, or just use the new crisis hotline 988, and you can ask for help on that line. You don't need to be in a, a suicide ideation. That's a fancy word for thinking about killing yourself. Uh, you don't have to be in that mode to use 988. And there's also 211, which is funded by the United Way, and they will help with uh, identifying mental health resources, both for depression or for counseling and support after a suicide. Next up, we discussed tips to help military veterans transition to college. Let's take a look. When you look at the numbers, um, a vast majority of our, our service members are going in because of the benefits, the, uh, what, the serv what their service can do for them at the, at the end of that journey is provide them an opportunity to attend higher education and to make, uh, make their life better. Um, so yeah, there, there's a lot of um, challenges. I, I think for us the, at the University of Illinois in particular, our focus is on that transition and making that as smooth as we can. Um, I think the areas that we see that are most challenging are where to go, what to pick. You know, if uh, the military is great at, at teaching us stuff and helping us along the way, but they're not, they're not uh, career or academic advisors. Um, and so a lot of these students um, have to make those decisions on their own. They have to figure it out on their own. So I think that's one of the, the challenges they face right away. Yeah, I think first and foremost is, you know, I always recommend to anybody who's thinking about separating from service is, is give yourself time to think about it. 
understand what that really means. Um, the military is going to give you a five day transition assistance program, five days for the rest of your life. Um, the military takes five days to train you how to drive up a truck. Why only five days to figure out who you are and what you're going to become on this next journey? And so I think it's really important that the service members think about it, what it means. Ask questions. There's people out there who've done it. They've done it successfully. Um, there are people out there who've done it and not done it successfully. Get some help. Get some guidance. Ask those questions um, so you can you can go in prepared. Um, you know, I hate to say it, but there's a lot of organizations, especially in higher education, that are out there willing to take advantage of service members um, and the GI Bill that they bring uh, because they're, they are ill-prepared sometimes to make that best right decision for them. So I think asking the questions and really having a plan for separation is important. Yeah, no, exactly. You absolutely do. And I think your peers are definitely a great source. Um, I think, you know, ideal world, you're, you're thinking about that transition as soon as you start. It, it sounds kind of, you know, maybe a little counterintuitive, but your military service will come at an end. No matter who you are, it will end at some point. So I think you have to have a plan for that. Um, there are a lot of wonderful organizations out there to help you bridge that gap between service and whatever those next steps are. Um, one of the ones that we're, we're fond of, of working with is the Warrior Scholar Project. It's a, it's a group that brings in um, recently separated or enlisted uh, service members who are about to separate and shows them what it looks like to go to college. They take them to you know, top tier Ivy League level you know, and top tier public schools and give them a taste of what it feels like and shows them, hey, you belong here, you can make it, but also educates them on the best path to take or, or a path to take. Um, so I think there's uh, that organization is going to reach out to. There's other ones around um, service to school comes to mind, which helps student uh, uh, prospective students figure it out. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a multitude of sources out there. It could be a little challenging to find them. So I think, you know, those service members are going to have to do a little work. I think your peer network is always a great one. You know, your, your, your ranger buddy is never going to lead you astray. And so I think that's always a good place to start. And that wraps up this episode of BRN Weekly. Have a topic of interest, somebody you think we should talk to, drop us a line. And don't forget, for all the latest curated news on lifestyle, wellness, finance, tech, so much more in all in one place, check out today's edition of our daily newsletter, The Morning Pulse. Want to search our archives, check out our latest content, then visit our website. We're back again tomorrow with another edition of BRN Sunday. I'll be joined by the Legal Eagles, David Levine, Kevin Walsh of Broom Law Group. And then we'll talk with Oliver Rennick of the Schwab Network to break down markets. You won't want to miss it. It's a great show. Until then, I'm Jeff Snyder. Stay safe. Keep on saving. And don't forget, roll with the changes. Now is your opportunity to co-create content around any topic on the first lifestyle and wellness network. Reach a global audience through our platform and co-own exclusive branded content. All of our programs are available on demand and also as audio only podcasts so you can take us on the go. Broadcast Retirement Network, available anytime, anywhere, and on any device.